Hi, this is Chris Jarman. I am here for Computer Music. I record under the aliases Kamikaze Space Program and Raiden. Uh, although the last couple of years have been you know, more known for my Kamikaze Space Program stuff, which is something with a weird mix of techno, electro, bass music and weird experimental stuff. And today I want to take you through uh, a remix that I've just done for Emika, who had previously released on Ninja Tunes and she's currently running her own label now and this track is basically for her new label. So uh, yeah, I might as well quite dip in. Uh, basically the tune's called Battles, so uh, the first thing I did was listen to the vocal. If I take all the effects off, just so you can listen to it. Whoa, battles. So that's the raw vocal. Battles. Each one I win. Still losing the war. So as you can hear, she's talking a lot about war, battles, things like that. So when I was thinking of what to do to the remix, because the original is about 111 BPM and it's more like an electro tune. So, so to conceptualise it, I started looking for sort of, you know, samples that involved kind of like guns or war or things like that to build my drums from. So um, obviously, you know, I spend a lot of time recording all my own sort of sound sources. Um, you know, I use all kinds of like strange microphones, EMR microphones, contact microphones, but um, I don't really have access to, you know, heavy military equipment or mines or anything like that. So I just scoured, uh, you know, documentaries for some sounds. So I basically built the kick from this, which is a mine. And then um, I got, Oh yeah, and that's some, some guns there. I think that was just a standard clap. I did try to use sort of gunshots for the snare, but it wasn't really it wasn't really working. And then oh, that's the other clap. That's a second kick, which I think is some kind of claymore mine. So I'm not sure what that is, but you can hear that it's uh, it's pretty crazy. And then, uh, so when I, that's a solo the beat, just the main part of the beat. So when you put all that together, if I go to the MIDI, so yeah, that's what you're seeing. So yeah, this kick's basically made from a mine. So the whole kit is basically Foley recorded. I've built my own custom drum rack. Um, basically the reason I made this is because when I got Push, um, you know, Push is really good on its own, but I think you really need to develop your own sort of custom systems for it to work properly. And so I could get a much faster workflow with Push, I built this drum rack. Um, all the cells here, they're all mapped out exactly how, you know, general MIDI works. So no matter what I switch around, it's always going to be the same. And within each cell, I've created uh, some mapping here. So. I've got a sample selector, which I'll show you in a sec. I've got um, pitch, I've got a uh, filter um, cutoff, a filter resonance, which is also attached to a filter envelope. Um, then I've got the decay and release, and all this is mapped into every single cell in the drum mic. So if, you, if I go here, as you can see, no matter where I go, I've always got this custom setup. And because it's all built into push, any of my encoders automatically sync to this. I've got this sample selector, which is the really cool bit that um, I find really helps my workflow. So as I was explaining earlier, I do a lot of things with Foley sounds. So I'll go out and record a bunch of sounds. Um, I'll get them all chopped up and get them all grouped into sort of like banks. Um, so if I go to, here we go, my folders. So that's to say I'm gonna select a, a hat and I'm gonna use say metal, metal taps, for example. So I'll go to the hat part, and I can hot swap uh, the bit that I need. So there you go. So I'm going to put that in there now. So wait for that to load up. And you can see I've got multiple samples. With the sample selector, I can just use this one encoder here to go for all my different sounds. It makes it really easy to find stuff. So if I quickly load up a kick as well, I can show how quick it is. So I'm just drag the cell on there. Kick will always be in the same place. So I can just get a beat going. So 
So now I can just go through all the different samples. So let's go to the kick. I have one now I really liked. And because I've got all those macros controls, I can just change the pitch. quick to make a beat and very uh, you can get really intricate really quickly just by using this custom drum rack um, on top of that I've actually got a top layer on it as well uh, let me just collapse this down so let's open this up here so it's got another level on top of it so it actually has a parallel um, distortion on it so I can add drive to what I've got that at the moment but what it does is say so you've got a kick over top of a snare it'll actually distort the two together so it's like kind of a rack within a rack and on that rack you've got the distortion and it sends varied amounts to here but it's running over the entire kit it's not like a normal send like I have here because I also have sends on the kit here like uh, I've just got two here as basic so there's a return here and a return here and if I go back to my original so now you've sort of got an understanding of how it works the actual custom drum rack Take that out a sec. So, so if we go to, um, you're saying about, was, you know, we're talking about inserts and what I've got going on here. So I can have my standard, you know, all my inserts in here, but then I can then send stuff off parallel using my sends within the drum rack and it's all nicely self-contained. Um, if I take you through the signal path of the kick or the, the, the bomb as it was. So what I've got set up here, um, this is going to be, as you, as you can see, I've got this rack set up on every single channel. And uh, basically what this rack does is that I'm really into um, gain staging. It's very important to me uh, for the levels which are travelling through every plugin. So, okay, so for this example, I've just got um, an EQ here to take the low end off the kick because I don't want anything, as you can see here, a lot of low end below 20 hertz which is just eating my headroom really so I get rid of that first then I've just got a little bit of EQ using the uh, my favorite um, API plugin from Waves I love uh, the, I love the sound of API uh, EQs they're just amazing for drums like API equipment I find tends to enhance the, the transient nature of drums um, I'm very much into like particular hard you know hardware emulations of EQs and compressors things like that and then here, this is a, oh yeah, then I've got this. This is um, a free plugin by LSR Audio called Level Meter. And this is what's um, allowing me to, to basically keep an eye on my levels. So you can see that's hitting zero. And what I've done, I've set this to minus 18 because um, a lot of plugins and what a lot of people don't know, for example, on say the Wave stuff and Slate Digital, things like that, that zero on here is actually minus 18 in the digital world. So by calibrating it this way, you're running to the old style VU meter. So actually, if I just show you how I actually get this all set up and then I can show you the last plugin. So <coughs> let's put the level meter at the front. So what I've got here is a rack set up. So I've got utility on each end and there's just literally a gain, there's like a gain uh, knob here, which I can use. So I'll put the, the level meter first. And what this gain meter is doing is it's pushing the volume up and down on the first one and then the, the reverse on the end. So whatever volume I do here is compensated for here. The reason I do that is, is so that I can gain stage my mix but um, not have to change my levels. I don't have to change all my levels when I come to the mix down stage. So I keep the integrity of the, of the vibe of the track levels wise but then I can then still pull all the levels down or up to get that minus 18 gain stage. So every time I do something on the plugin, so yeah, that's calibrated to zero. I'll then move this level meter to the end of the next plugin. And then any change that I make, I can basically use the output of the, um, of the plugin to, to make sure that I'm always running at minus 18. So yeah, this needs to come down just a little bit. So now so I move the level meter to the API. And again, you see the 
levels exactly the same. So I've turned the output of the level down. And the reason for that is, see when I switch the EQ off, the level's exactly the same. So yeah, so any EQ boost, any compression that I do, I'm actually hearing whether it's actually benefiting the tune or not. And it's really good. It almost it's a way of like calibrating your ears because sometimes you know you EQ something or compress something, and the, the volume jump is going to make you think that what you're hearing is better when it's not. So this way, my levels are constantly controlled. And the other reason for doing this minus 18 thing, and this is my secret weapon. Uh, this is a plugin called Strip Bus by SK Note. It only costs like 20 pounds, um, and it's basically emulating a uh, it emulates classic mixing uh, consoles and there's a lot of these kind of software around and I'm actually using a multitude of them together so you've got like four choices of consoles you've got like a, a ducking feature which helps glue the tracks together and you've got these basic EQs which are very shallow and very transparent and you can use those to fine-tune uh, the EQ once it's done and this is another awesome part of it which is crosstalk so what it'll do it'll bleed all the other channels very quietly into this one channel. And then you can really hear that at the moment. But what you're getting is basically bleed from the channels like you would on a real analog mixing console. And I also like using the filters as well. I've got a, uh, a, hot, uh, is it a low pass filter on this set to about 18k. So this is on every single channel on the mix. In the matter where, and that rack setup is on every single channel on the mix with the level meter and the strip bus. So that way my high end is being completely controlled throughout the entire entire mix down. Basically the rack that's on every single channel will just will consist of the level meter and the strip bus. And then I can just put whatever plug-in I want in between the two utilities and then the, the level meter will move between all the outputs of the different plugins, so that way I know what the levels are. But the, the stock setup that's in my um, preset library will just be the rack, level meter, and the strip bus, and then I can build on everything. So that's just the kick channel. But as you can see, as I move across all the other channels within my drum rack, it's kind of the same. You still got the level meter, strip bus, but it'll be a different combination of plugins. Um, to get this kick a little bit bigger. Like basically, I'm really into compression, but I don't like over compression. Generally, I try to parallel compress my kicks because I, I want to keep them natural sounding, but also give them a little bit extra weight. So I use this trick quite often. Um, I've got lots of different ones, but for this tune, this is the one that worked the best. This is one of my favorite compressors for kick drums. Um, the VC160 by Native Instruments. Uh, and is it with soft tune? No. But yeah, VC160 with, uh, by Native Instruments, and it emulates the DBX160, which is one of the best kick drum compressors ever made. So within my return system inside my rack, I've got, um, I'm sending this signal off to the return. And this is the signal here. You can see it's adding like a real thump to the front end. And then after it, I'm running a Poltec EQ. Now the reason for this is, I'll quickly show you. So we're just listening to the parallel chain at the moment. Yeah, I'm compressing the kick really hard as well, about minus 10 dB of gain reduction, which is a huge amount for compression, but it's parallel, which is what you know, so you're meant to do that. So yeah, I'm aiming for minus 10 dB. So if I switch this off, you can I can hear that the, the compression is taking away a little bit of low end. So I'm using this Poltec EQ to add that low end back in that the compressor's taking away. And then I can mix, I mix that back into the original kick signal. And what I get left with is a big, heavy, monstrous kick, or in this case, a mine. So if I can turn that off, see the body, the body of the kick drum's kind of disappeared. Just got that extra little bit of weight. Right, the clap is a very similar process to the kick, really. I've used, uh, again, I've used the API. Uh, this time I've used the API 550B, which is basically the same as the one that I used on the kick, but it's a four band. So I can get a little bit more of a, I can dial it in a little bit more. Uh, again, see it's level meter, just to make sure that nothing is going over minus 18 uh, dB, which preps it for the strip bus. 
And again, you can see I've got the shelf there, making sure the high end isn't too much with the cross torque. I haven't done, seem to have done too much with the EQ there. And now this is also running into a parallel chain. Uh, this parallel chain is a little bit more simple. I'm just using the um, I'm using the the Waves SSL bus compressor, which is one of my favourite compressors. It's very musical. Uh, like SSL stuff is generally quite musical sounding, um, very clinical. They, I know there's lots of um, um, SSL emulations around at the moment, but this is like the first one that I got, and I'm just kind of sticking with it because I know it sounds really well. There's one thing I did forget to mention about all these drum hits, is once I've found the drum hit that I like, one extra layer of processing that I'll do, is that I'll record everything through this, uh, I'll record the single hit through the tape machine. This tape machine just sort of gives it a little bit of like natural analog kind of sound. Um, I mean, I do use a lot of, as I'll show you in a minute, I'm using quite a lot of tape enhancers, but you can't beat the real thing. So all the real hits will go through this, and a lot of the, anything which is sample based will generally go through this at some point. It, it just adds a tone and a character to my sound. And there's one extra bit of this clap. Um, one thing I only discovered recently, you know, as you know when you make music, there's always something that you go, oh yeah, I didn't know that. And that's you can actually route this send, your sends within your drum rack, to another send. Uh, all I do is go to the output of here and you see you've got your list of other things. So I'm now sending the output of this return to a return here because I don't want it to be affected by the stuff that's going on top of the effects that are going on the drum rack. So when I'm sending from C, it goes into C return here, and then this is then being outputted to this reverb here. And this is actually, um, I got this, I just bought this last year, um, my latest plugin purchase. I absolutely adore this reverb. It's the Eventide Ultra Reverb. Um, I'm a massive fan of Future Sound of London, and legend has it that they use lots of eventide reverbs on their sound so when they released the software version of their h8000 series reverb module i jumped on it basically and they had an introductory offer to buy it for 50 quid so i was all in and uh, i'm literally using this on everything at the moment and uh, i'm running quite a lot of heavy reverb on this clap it says clap on its own if i take the reverb off it's quite flat and quite dry Switch the reverb on. Gives it a more kind of like an electro, electro kind of feel. Right, the next bit in the tune to keep into the same theme of like battles. Are you um, to create like um, like a shaker? Instead of just using a standard shaker or something that's programmed, I took. Um, I think. Let's see what it is. I think it's a mini gun. And I've turned that into um, into a shaker. So what I'll do, as I show, yeah, here we go. I've just I've pre pre-prepared. This is the original sound. Then what I'll do is quantize each individual hit. If you open that right up, so each hit, you know, sets a warp marker into sixteens. So it becomes this. I think it's a bit slower. So if I play that, so that becomes so a minigun is now a shaker. But to take this a little bit further, this is a thing that I do all the time with things like shakers, sometimes hats. It's like a trick to um, have a double tracking effect, so it becomes extremely wide and just and clears out the middle. So I'll, as you can see, I've got one here, and the start point starts here. Then the, the next channel will be a copy of it, but it starts slightly off. So they're never playing the same sample twice, and then these are panned hard left and right. So if I play these two together, so if you listen to that now, it's extremely wide and it doesn't affect the middle. There's one thing that I like, I mean, we all want to have our music loud, but I don't want to make it physically loud, I just want to make it sound loud. And I find that having things very cleverly placed in terms of stereo spectrum can make things appear loud, you know, because they're, they're big, they're wide. And that's a way that I kind of get loudness without actually pushing like levels too hard. So yeah, that's a really cool trick that I do. And you can do it with shakers or anything like that. You get a lovely wide sound. And I just group these together. And then, then I can just use one chain. Um, as you can see again, similar stuff as before. Um, I might as well break this channel down actually. 
because um, I really want to sh uh, see. You can see my, I've got my gain staging set up as per usual. This is a plugin that I'm really obsessed with. It's by um, Acoustica Audio and it's called Nebula. And it basically emulates classic hardware. Um, if I go into my bank here, Nebula is a convolution uh, plugin, kind, but kind of, it's a lot more. The best way to describe it is that most convolution plugins take a static black and white photograph of the hardware that you're emulating. But this Nebula system is more like a 3D holographic movie of the, of the, uh, of the hardware that it's emulating. Um, you run a signal through it and it actually works with um, <coughs> not just, uh, it works with time, dynamics. It is, it is the, you know, it is hands down the most accurate plugin out there for emulating hardware at the moment. But it's very tricky to use. It doesn't look very nice, and you have to gain stage it very well, as it won't work properly. As you can see here, I've got um, SSL stuff. I've got SSL console, SSL EQs. I've got Neve consoles, Neve EQs. I've got things which emulate old record players, and you've actually got people who sell these sell these as bundles online they'll they're it's kind of open source people just go to the forum they um, they emulate their equipment using really good converters and you end up with really realistic sounds of some really classic analog gear the only bad thing about it is it's extremely cpu intensive so cpu intensive that sometimes i have to bounce the channels down or do parts of the track elsewhere and then bring it in because it is so so heavy but when it comes to sound it's absolutely second to none so that's one of my one of my other secret weapons, and you'll see this in the rest of the rest of the track and in the chain. I'm actually using a, um, an emulation of a Revox tape machine, which I've got sat right here. <laughs> but this particular Revox preset, um, I really like to use on hats. It just seems to like add a little bit of high end crunch, but it also removes a little bit of high end, and it just gives it less of a sort of digital kind of sound. And also, it's one thing you've probably noticed because everything that I'm using is basically a recording. Um, that's analog, basically. It's not. I'm not using. Uh, they're not like synths or anything like that. So just by applying on lots of analog, you know, analog recorded signals, then analog emulation software on top of it, and this, it, it really makes the sound rich. I don't know if you're going to be able to hear this because, to be honest with you, it's extremely subtle. It's kind of dull without it. It just sort of sparkles the high end a little bit. And you can see like, they have a code on it, so that's Revox. Minus, uh, that must mean 15 IPS, and I think that's the gain setting there. So that's the shaker. Well, and that's, basic, that's my whole drum beat. Then this is all fed into groups. So I have a group for my drums, a group for my leads. I've got a group here for the vocals. The groups will change depending on which you know the which type of sounds that I have within the tune. So if I cover the drum bus, so what I'm doing, I'm sending everything into a return track. The reason I do it this way and not as a group is because on Ableton you can't put groups within groups, and also this organises my projects as if it was a real analog mixing console. I'm you know I'm so used to using old consoles that I try to have the layout exactly the same. So I set the outputs of my channels to send only. And then I just send them to the required bus. So bus A, so A is my bus. So all of the, all of these will get sent send only to the drums. So again, I've got my gain stage set up. So if I switch off the whole chain first, so you can hear what's going on. It sounds a little bit flat. And so what's going into this chain? is I've got my nebula here and this nebula is uh, the emulation here is the return out is the the return sends of the SSL console so it's actually a recording convolution recording of that and it just it just adds some tightness to the sound I will do this pretty much in every tune if I'm going for a much more punchy hi-fi kind of sound I will use the SSL desk and if I'm looking for a much more warmer fatter bulbous sound I'll use the Neve Just kind of adding some bigness to the sound. Right, so this is um, the next part of the chain after the nebula would be um, the virtual, what is it called? Yeah, the, the Slate Digital VCC. 
and I just I just use the the mix bus section of it. So as you saw, all the channels in the project are all going through strip bus because I like that as a stage because you have all the all the tools like cross talk things like that. And by the time I get to the actual buses, I'll use a completely different setup. So Nebula, virtual um, virtual mix bus, and I've set this to a uh, Neve console because it's quite warm and quite fat. So I'll turn that off. Again, it's very subtle, but what I find is to get the big sound, it's all about doing lots of little things at every stage. So that's like the, the analog setup, and at the end of the chain, I use the Slate Digital reel-to-reel -reel tape machine, and I always run the buses at, um, on a two-inch 16 track, because it's exactly if you were tracking on a studio, and I always sell it to a modern tape, and on buses I generally run it at um, 30 inches per second. 30 makes things more shiny and 15 is kind of more like bass heavy. That's the, that's the, the, the signal path that I'll start with, um, that I'll run the drums through. And then all I need to do is add just a little bit of tightening. So I'll use a little bit of EQ. This is um, quite a favourite EQ of mine to run on the drum bus, which is the Passive EQ, which is based on the Manly Massive Passive. By, it's a collaboration between soft tube and native instruments. Um, this is yeah, it's really nice. Sometimes I'll use um, EQs from Nebula. Um, but yeah, all I've done is just notched up a little bit of low end, a little bit of tickling on the top end, just to sort of tighten it up. You can hear it's not a lot. Like I don't want to overprocess all my sounds. You know, I want to get them as good as I can at the source. So when it gets to this stage, it can do its job a lot better. And then I think I'm just yep, I'm just using again a little bit of SSL. Very, very, very small amount. And what that's doing is just capturing the top of the kick and just creating a little bit of glue for the beat. And again, you see, I've got my level meter. So when I switch the compressor off, the volume is exactly the same. So I can listen to see if that compressor's actually, you know, enhanced the beat or made it worse. Um, when I'm actually writing, what I'll tend to do is I'll put a whole bunch of compressors, I'll, sit, um, I'll have five or six different compressors and I'll AB through every single compressor to find the one which is giving the right musical quality to the sound. Um, I really like the 1176 also by Waves, I like the Pi compressor by Waves, but you never know which, which compressor's right for that beat, you have to try them all out uh, and when you get the right one you just feel it, it's just like a vibe and some energy you know, kind of gets added to the track. So that pretty much covers all the drum work. Right, for the bass line of the tune, um, the original track had sort of a real nice analog, sort of sawtoothy kind of sound. So I wanted to kind of get something similar and expand on it, but I, um, but I wanted to make it just a little bit more edgy. So I've just used analog from Ableton. So I just, if I play the whole, the whole patch, I'll solo it from the bus. So it's made up of three layers that I've, um, I've basically grouped together in a rack. Is it a rack? No, separate channels that I've grouped together. So it's got this analog here, well, I've just made a very simple sawtooth patch. Two sawtooth waves, detuned. Again, it goes into my, my strip brush channel. This is uh, another very favourite EQ of mine um, from one of my favourite bundles by Plugin Alliance. This is the Mag EQ. I just find this really musical, it can add air and it's really good on synths and vocals and things like that. And again, ah, and I've also used this plugin, which came with, which is a free plugin from Slate Digital, and it's something that adds, again, analog character because it's come straight out of Ableton, and I didn't want to track it to tape because it would just, um, I want to keep, you know, keep all the automation and things like that. I just use this and it's really nice, it just adds thickness to the sound. If you'll be able to hear it. Again, it's just really subtle, you'll find, you'll find that all the processes are much more than the sum of their parts. 
So that's just giving it that thickness. And again, strip bus. Then I've added a, a subtle sub layer underneath it. Just give it a little bit more extra weight and I'm using operator. And I use 99% of my bass lines are made using operator in Ableton. I, I just adore it. Uh, it's like a basic FM synth. For this one, I'm just doing two sine waves slightly detuned off each other. It's great, like a bit of movement. Again, I've done a, a cut on the 20 hertz again because I don't want any like low end information eating my headroom. Bit of saturator from Ableton, and this is going into more nebula. Uh, this particular nebula setting is a rare Moog synth EQ from the 1970s, and this is the preamp stage of the of that um, Moog EQ. And then that's running into the EQ section, so it's a really good emulation because you're getting the, the actual EQ, the preamp stage, and you're also getting the EQ stage. And it's this is like my favourite EQ for EQing bass. I've never really found a decent VST for EQing bass, but this Moog Moog patch is just uh, Moog EQ patch is just amazing. I'm using a little bit of Kramer uh, Kramer Pi, which is uh, I quite like this because it knocks off a little bit of the low end. I think I'm hitting this one quite hard. Like I'll never really compress much more than minus three d, mi minus three dB. But yeah, the, the Kramer tape just seems to like nudge a little bit of that low end off and kind of shift the, the bias of the tone upwards. So there's the revival, and then again, strip bus every channel. So that's the sub the sub patch, and then just to give it just that little bit more something, um, I'm just using white noise white noise generators off of the um, operator and as anyone who knows my music quite well I'm obsessed with white noise um, this is a really basic white noise setup sometimes I will use I've got one here I use one of these which is a EMR microphone which basically picks up electromagnetic radiation um, I usually wave it over the tape machine or go out field recording and just pick up static signals I'll add that to the signal sometimes so where a lot of the hiss comes from I'll get hiss from anywhere I can I've got a saturator literally smashing the white noise to pieces. And then this is uh, one of my favourite plugins. Um, this is Trash by uh, Isotope. I'd basically be paralysed without this. Um, I haven't used it so much in this tune, but um, sometimes I'll run whole drum kits through it. So yeah, Isotope Trash to, rip, to smash it even harder because I really want the white noise to stick out. Some EQ just to roll off the low end and the high end, and then it goes into my game stage with my strip bus. One major thing that I'd like to point out with this is that I've set the spread wide, so the centre of the bass is kind of in mono, but the outside of it is extremely wide. So again, you're making the bass sound really, really big and you know, taking over the sort of, you know, when something's wide, it sounds big. So you put that all together and you get that. And then that goes to a bus. This bus is a lot more simple than the drum bus. So again, I've got Nebula, but this Nebula is a clean version of from the SSL, um, you know, returns. Then again, goes to my virtual mix rack, and this one's set to a SSL 4000D series console with a bit of drive. And again, the same setup. I've got it on group there, as you see. It's the same tape setup as you saw on the drum bus. So all the sounds are all going through like the same uniform um, tape machines and um, you know, analog answers. Um, on the white noise coming from my trash, there's a little bit of a tail on there. Uh, that's just a delay coming off of the um, off of the trash, like a digital delay. I'm not actually on this particular white noise thing. I'm not using much of the modules on trash. I'm just using the trash module itself using a faulty um, sort of uh, sound. So it's not like distorting as such, it's more destroying the sound, like it's a faulty piece of electronics. And then just, yeah, a tiny, tiny little bit of delay with a little bit of feedback, just to give it a little bit of tail. Because um, I found that because this tune's got a like, very reverberated vocal, um, it would have been too much to put reverb on it. So I've just put a tiny little tail just to take, take a little bit of dryness off the end of the bass. So when it fits with the beat, let's take the pads out.
engineer, it's lots of textures. Everything's about textures. And I find with using Foley sound white noise, I get this really intricate texture. It gives me a lot to play around with. And that's all we've got time for. And if you want to check out some more of this, go and buy the latest issue of Computer Music. Download over 30 exclusive plugins. Get hundreds of pro quality samples and power up your production skills with in-depth tutorials. We break it down for you step by step and you'll see exactly how it's done in expert video guides and producer masterclass sessions with pro producers. Get all this and more with Computer Music Magazine every month on iPad and iPhone, PC and Mac, Android and in print.